Again, I'm so delighted to have been invited by Steve to, to share a presentation with you. Um, for some of the folks who are um, longtime friends of the Art Deco Society of Washington, this uh, the presentation I'm about to share is a, a greatly expanded um, kind of update of an introduction I provided to the Society at the AFI Silver several years ago, um, I think prior to a screening of The Thin Man. Um, I did a, a brief presentation on Cedric Gibbons and MGM, um, which is what the, the focus of this presentation is, is really all about. Um, so you might see a few things that uh, you saw in that presentation several years ago, but it's, um, it's grown quite a bit <laughs> since then uh, and definitely uh, covers a lot of territory from um, kind of the, the birth of motion pictures and just give a little bit of context and background to really help you have a foundation in understanding why Cedric Gibbons is so significant and why the MGM art department um, really had such an influence on scenic design, especially in the late 1920s and into the 30s. Um, I do give a little bit of an overview of all the other studios that were active at that time, the little three and the big five. Um, so we'll get to that as well. So it's a, it's a, a fun journey. Um, it is a recording, so uh, because there are film clips included in the presentation, I just wanted to make sure that the audio with me speaking over them or trying to explain certain points um, was very clear um, and could flow as easily as possible without hiccups of technology getting in the way. Um, but the benefit of sharing it this way is that I should be able to monitor the chat and if there are questions coming up, either go ahead and answer them or, or jot down what people are looking for more information on. Um, and then after the presentation, I'm going to come back on live and then and then talk with you further um, and answer any questions you might have, um, hear from you what some of your favorites are. I would love to know. Um, but otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and shift over to um, the presentation. Uh, so I hope you enjoy it lasts just a little bit over an hour. Um, so just it, hopefully you have a, a nice cool drink, as Steve said. Um, are in a comfortable spot and are ready to um, take a little journey through the history of film, uh, the history of MGM, and specifically the importance of Mr. Cedric Gibbons at MGM. Thank you. The birth of the modern Hollywood studio system in the 1920s coincided with a revolution in modern architecture and design. Studio creatives like Cedric Gibbons, supervising art director at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer from 1924 to 1956, drew inspiration from and helped popularize current trends in architecture, interior design, and fashion, such as those exhibited at the 1925 International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts at Paris. Beginning in earnest with Our Dancing Daughters in 1928, Cedric Gibbons and his talented staff of unit art directors, most notably Richard Day and Merrill Pye, produced a quick succession of films featuring striking displays of modern furniture and clothing the cumulative aesthetic of these films could be called, quite simply, MGM Modern, a stylized glamour that rem remains indelibly linked to not only the popular image, but also to the history of Art Deco in America. The story goes that Gibbons attended the 1925 exposition in Paris and returned a changed man determined to spread the gospel of modernism through film design. This particular story gets repeated often and is just one of several embellishments found in Gibbons' studio biography. It is also a vast oversimplification of his skill as an artist and his importance as an industry leader. The truth is more complicated, of course, but nobody can deny the profound influence Gibbons did have on film design and popular taste throughout Hollywood's golden age, a period roughly defined as lasting from 1927 to 1948. To understand how this came to pass, it's worth talking a bit about the state of film production and design before Gibbons came into a position of power in Hollywood. The American film industry may have been born on the East Coast, but it matured in the West, although some studios remained in New York and New Jersey, 
as well as other locations across the country well into the 1920s and later. Most companies had shifted their production work to California by the early to mid-teens. By this time, longer, multi-reel films, largely from Europe and with ever-improving production values and higher ticket prices, were replacing the eclectic short programs of the Nickelodeon era. The Italian superproduction you see here, Cabiria, is just one example of the incredible strides underway in terms of scenic design in the 1910s, as sets got bigger and bolder and film storytelling matured. Cabiria is one of the first true epic films featuring massive sets, special effects, and creative camera movement, as well as a nearly three-hour runtime. The film played in many American cities for several years and influenced the work of D.W. Griffith, particularly in his 1916 film, Intolerance. At the same time, new theater construction was chasing a seemingly endless demand for bigger and better venues to screen these bigger and better films. Soon production companies would start buying up entire theater chains as outlets for their pictures, and theater operators would launch their own production companies to have better pictures for their palaces. This process of vertical integration in which the production, distribution, and exhibition of films was controlled by industry conglomerates would become the hallmark of the studio era. As motion pictures came of age, the First World War severely disrupted European film production and opened the door for American entrepreneurs, triggering an even greater expansion of capital investment. By war's end, the heart of the global film market had fully shifted to the United States. By 1919, nearly 90% of all films screened in Europe, Africa, and Asia were produced in America. And of these, most were produced in the Los Angeles area. The city alone grew at a remarkable pace during the 1920s, jumping from 10th to 5th largest city in the country by decade's end. In 1918, when Cedric Gibbons got his start as a set dresser in the Bronx, he was entering the film business at just the right moment. In his recent biography of Cedric Gibbons, author Howard Guttner outlines several formative experiences for the future supervising art director. Number one would be his working as a draftsman in his father's contracting and architecture business in New York, which taught him how to work with tradesmen and how to stay organized when working on multiple projects at once. Number two would be his experience taking classes at the Art Students League in New York, which not only trained him in the fundamentals of design, but also exposed him to lectures by artist Hugo Ballin on the subject of scenic design and motion pictures. Ballin would be the one to give Gibbons his first job in the business. Number three would be his work as an illustrator at the J. Walter Thompson Advertising Agency, which likely sharpened his understanding of how the combination of visuals and a good story could boost consumer demand. He also witnessed how a sharp appearance could command respect. Taken together, these experiences gave Gibbons a powerful set of skills that he would soon put to use as a builder, draftsman, artist, manager, and industry promoter all rolled into one. In 1918, Gibbons was invited by Hugo Ballin to come work as a set dresser at Edison Studios in New York. When Ballin was offered a five-year contract at Goldwyn Pictures Corporation in Fort Lee, New Jersey, Gibbons joined as his assistant. The following year, Goldwyn bought the impressive Triangle Studio lot in Culver City, California and headed west. Ballin went along as one of the studio's primary art directors and Gibbons made the move soon after. As an art director, Ballin was committed to bringing art to the masses. Author Caroline Luce notes that Ballin's use of receding planes and oversized features, such as the high drapes and curving staircase seen here, quote, created a new visual code that helped to convey the drama and meaning of films, and in doing so, advanced a new body of decorative motifs recognizable to American film audiences. In this instance, the scale, rich textures, and visual hints at spaces beyond the area of action instantly evoke an impression of great wealth. Throughout the teens and twenties, and to a degree into the 1930s, during a time of rapid industrialization and social and economic change, stories that featured upper-class intrigue and romance were broadly popular, offering escape and aspirational imagery for working-class audiences. Before joining the film trade in 1917, Ballin had been a well-regarded Beaux-Arts portrait painter and muralist who contributed several important works to the Wisconsin State Capitol. As production in the U.S. became more standardized in the 1920s, independent-minded film artists like Ballin chafed under studio hierarchies and found few paths forward within the industry. 
By decade's end, Ballin would return to painting, creating several important works for Art Deco landmarks, like the Title Guarantee and Trust Building and the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. When Ballin left to start his own short-lived production company in 1921, Gibbons was promoted to supervising art director at Goldwyn. Here are just a few settings that Gibbons created while under the Goldwyn Pictures banner. These rarely published images were reproduced in Christina Wilson's excellent dissertation on Gibbons and were just too good to pass up on including here, especially the view of the stepped archways in remembrance on the bottom left. Arches like these, if not these exact wall units, show up again and again later in the decade, surrounded by zigzag modern furnishings. The arch is a design motif that Gibbons was already known for by this time. In a 1923 story about motion picture studio life, the director of Remembrance, Rupert Hughes, describes looking in on the editing room and catching glimpses of different films, including one showing, quote, a torrent of luxury, a reception in a home of wealth designed by Cedric Gibbons, lover of arches and interlaced perspectives, beautiful women in gleaming dresses dancing or listening to love stories, or letting tears drip like diamonds upon their fans of white peacock feathers, end quote. Reading that, one might think he was describing a future Greta Garbo or Joan Crawford picture. During his tenure at Goldwyn, Gibbons remained a true believer in Ballin's ideas about the narrative power of film architecture and was committed to designing sets that would enhance character and mood through uncluttered lines and a strong, visually balanced sense of space. His preference as a film designer would always lean towards elegance and harmony over the more expressionistic tendencies found elsewhere. The stylish design seen here from one of Gibbon's earliest films was widely promoted by Goldwyn as a quality picture. The young art director was already making a name for himself as an artist worth watching. Gibbons assumed control of a studio art department at an important moment in the history of film design, just as the American film landscape was beginning to assume the contours of what would become the modern studio system a number of European artists and architects were pushing the boundaries of film as a modern art form and advocating for greater experimentation in terms of set decoration and narrative technique. As a medium that fuses architecture, fashion, graphic design, and the decorative arts, film was seen to have great potential as a means of aesthetic uplift, a mission that demanded artists to lead the way. Seen here are examples of settings designed by renowned Viennese stage designer and architect Joseph Urban, an American avant-garde filmmaker and wife to Rudolph Valentino, Natasha Rambova, alongside the influential work of French film director Marcel Lerbier, whose collaborations with architect Robert Mallet Stevens were among the most significant works created during this time. Of these collaborations, Lignumain remains the most well-known, blending social melodrama and science fiction elements into an unsettling whole. This set has always struck me as somewhat of a precursor to the MGM modern sets to come, with the boudoir's bare walls, tremendous scale, arches, and scattered modern furnishings. I wanted to show a quick clip from the restored print of Lignumain, which captures some of the film's strangeness in terms of its avant-garde costuming and set designs by Cubist painter Fernand Leger. The film is also noteworthy for its blending of natural locations with over-the-top theatrical settings, technological fantasy, and dramatic visual effects. Leger was drafted into the production by L'Herbier and, after his experience working on this film, would go on to create an even more abstract work of modernist cinema, the Dadaist film Belle Mécanique, also in 1924. The film's star, opera singer Georgette Leblanc, co-produced the film with American financing and helped to distribute it to American audiences under the title The New Enchantment in 1926. Whether they took inspiration from Cubism, Futurism, Expressionism, or any other modernist movement, film offered exciting opportunities for the promotion of new forms for a new, more modern world. However, although avant-garde designs like these were seen in the U.S. and did attract attention, it was not always positive. Called out as bizarre or ultra-modernistic in the press, films in this vein were never part of sustained or studio-supported movement, either in the U.S. or abroad. At this time, there were similarly extravagant films being produced by American filmmakers, but these typically took the form of biblical epics like those produced by Cecil B. DeMille, 
historical extravaganzas like Universal's recreation of the Paris Opera House for Phantom of the Opera in 1925, or fantasies such as Douglas Fairbanks' The Thief of Baghdad, 1924. The latter remains one of the most well-designed films produced of any era. It features the incredible talents of a young art director, William Cameron Menzies, working with his mentor Anton Grott, who combines Western Art Nouveau with Islamic architectural forms and Eastern decoration into an exotic, exaggerated whole. Even though some American films of the early 1920s were becoming more sophisticated architecturally, and architectural publications were paying attention, most of the films produced at this time could not really compare to what was being built outside the theater, or as part of the theater itself, at least not yet. In early 1920s era Los Angeles, historic revivalism still held sway, with only the rare foray outside of the conservative norm, such as Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollyhock House built in 1922, or his In His House, 1924. And while a number of European modernist architects and designers struggled to get a foothold in the growing city, such as Rudolf Schindler, Jock Peters, J.R. Davidson, and later Richard Neutra, it would take time and a certain Paris exposition before Angelinos would be ready to accept their work more broadly. Some, like Peters and Davidson, found work as art directors in the picture business before they could make their mark on the local landscape. By 1924, however, things were starting to move in a new direction. Within only a few short years, one of the most powerful studios in film history would be born. A display of decorative arts across the Atlantic would inspire a new generation of designers and businesses, and Cedric Gibbons would become an ambassador for an emerging modernist movement in America. Up to now, I've hopefully provided some context for what was going on in the world of film in the years leading up to the 1925 exposition in Paris, and how the stage was being set for Gibbons to assert his own vision in terms of film design. When Marcus Lowe of the Lowe's Theatre chain formed Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM, in 1924, he did so by merging three separate production entities into one powerhouse studio. Number one was Metro Pictures, which Lowe had acquired earlier in order to secure better films for his theaters. Number two was Goldwyn Pictures Corporation, which brought along not only more content, but also its sizable Culver City studio facilities. And number three, veteran theater owner and producer, Louis B. Mayer. Mayer had been one of the co-founders of the original Metro, but by 1924, he'd established his own production outfit on the West Coast. When the three-way merger took place, Mayer was installed as studio chief, and his young and talented colleague, Irving G. Thalberg, put in charge of production, and MGM was born. I wanted to share a little bit of this wonderful tour of MGM in 1925, produced the year after the studio's founding. The film is a remarkable demonstration of self-confidence and fearless self-promotion, with stars, directors, cinematographers, and all manner of infrastructure put on display. The studio's institutional hierarchy and strict division of labor flowed from and through its innovative central producer system led by Irving Thalberg, whose canny ability to sense trends and know quality when he read it or saw it made him a valuable ally for Gibbons from the start. The studio's Fordist production process operated like a glorified assembly line where stories were selected, written, designed, directed, and packaged by separate departments working in parallel. Seen here is the French designer Erte, who was brought to MGM by Mayer in hopes of further elevating the MGM brand. Erte's stay was short-lived, however, and he was gone within a year, soon replaced by the more business-savvy but no less talented fashion designer, Adrian. The woman you see identified as Lucille Lesseur will soon change her name to Joan Crawford. When MGM was formed, Louis B. Mayer cherry-picked staff from each organization, and Gibbons was one of the few Goldwyn employees kept on board, and soon he was being identified in the trades as the studio's art director-in-chief. His salary incre increased steadily until he was earning over $650 a week, more than double the amount paid to other department heads. Historian Mark Scheel shares that in 1936, Gibbons was the only art director included on the U.S. Treasury's annual list of the most highly paid individuals in the nation. His role at MGM was a position that Gibbons would hold for 32 years, through the Great Depression 
and World War II, and well into the mid-century era of suburban developments. Going back to the start of his tenure at MGM, Gibbons quickly matched the structure of his art department to that of the studio. In addition to managing budgets and overseeing how projects were assigned space and time within the studio production stages and on the back lot, he would review new projects with Thalberg and other producers, determine their design approach, and then assign films to unit art directors known for their facility with particular genres or categories of films. Like Thalberg, there were always some films for which he would be more involved day to day. In 1925, the year that the promotional film was produced, Gibbons was not only coordinating the new company's growing art department, but he was also contributing to the design of over 20 films, some with hints of modern decor to come, like the Norma Shearer films pictured above, as well as two major productions that would cement the studio's reputation as the ultimate in spectacle, quality, and mass appeal. The release of both Ben-Hur and King Vidor's World War I saga, The Big Parade, in late 1925, put MGM on very solid ground and paved the way for the studio's widespread expansion, both in terms of its physical plant in Culver City and in terms of production. MGM produced 21 pictures in its first year, but by 1927 that number had grown to nearly 50, a pace that would remain constant through the 1930s. But when did the MGM modern aesthetic really begin, and why? In 1925, the studio was only just getting its legs, even if it did put on a good behind-the-scenes show for the cameras. It would still be a few years before Gibbon's art department would kick things off in full force with Our Dancing Daughters and A Woman of Affairs in 1928. When he did, some familiar stock sets used in Ben-Hur would make a nice cameo. In fact, it would be MGM's practice of saving everything and the creative ways in which its art directors reused a fairly small assortment of stock furniture and set decorations that would define the studio's modernist output between 1928 and 1932. So what about the Paris Exposition, on view from April to October 1925? Beyond the variety of projects already outlined, according to historian Christina Wilson, Gibbon's signature appears on pay stubs throughout that year, confirming that he did not have the luxury of getting away to Paris for research or pleasure. And Howard Guttner, in his recent biography of Gibbons, agrees, noting that the realities of travel would have meant a week-long train trip to New York, followed by a transatlantic journey in both directions. But just because Gibbons did not attend the Paris Exposition does not mean that he was untouched by its effects or by the widespread circulation of images of its many dramatic and luxurious installations it simply would not have been possible for the head of any art department, much less MGM's art department, to not closely monitor developments in the field of contemporary decorative arts and architecture. Research was always essential to film design, whether for past forms or contemporary trends. Eventually, you do see film sets inspired by the French art moderne, from angular furniture and beds on raised platforms, to stepped ceilings, fluted columns, and patterned fabrics and floor coverings. It would all make an appearance. Hollywood just needed a push before it could commit. Not surprisingly, films produced in France were more up to date in terms of capturing contemporary trends and furnishings. One of the filmmakers using these forms would still be Marcel Lerbier, whose work we saw earlier with the clip from Le Numain. Another significant contributor would be Belgian filmmaker Jacques Federe, whose 1926 film Grebiche, seen here in the top two photographs, include several elements that would be echoed by MGM two years later, from the wide view of the dining table and centered arch on the left to the built-in bookcases, stepped and curving walls and furnishings on the right. In fact, MGM did not so much echo Fader's work as appropriate it. In 1928, the director was signed a short-lived contract with the studio from 1928 to 1933, with the enormously stylish 1929 Garbo feature, The Kiss, being his first contribution to the MGM Modern brand. Although Gibbons didn't travel to Paris in 1925, he was in New York for two weeks in January of 1926, when the city was still buzzing with excitement about the exposition, which had closed only a few short months before. It seems he just missed the February opening of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's exhibition with selected works from Paris, the same exhibition that would soon travel to several American cities, though none further west than Minneapolis. It's unknown who exactly Gibbons visited or what he did 
apart from getting married very briefly and very quickly the weekend before returning to California. What is known is that he was friendly with many designers based in New York, including Paul Frankel, who had recently opened a new showroom featuring his skyscraper furniture. Designs that would be called, quote, the fat of the moment, end quote, by Good Furniture Magazine within a year's time. Beyond this initial assortment of events triggered by the 1925 exposition, there were developments closer to home that may have helped push MGM in the direction of more modernist settings. One major event would have been the late 1926 opening of Kem Weber's Modes and Manners shop. Weber had spent several years working for Barker Brothers, the area's largest department store with a veritable monopoly on furniture sales in Southern California. His responsibilities had rapidly grown from designing individual revivalist pieces to overseeing factory production and store displays. When the firm tasked Weber with designing all of the interiors for its new 12-story flagship store in downtown Los Angeles, he took the opportunity to travel to Europe for research. In addition to stops in Spain and Germany, Weber traveled to France, where he visited numerous designers busy preparing their exhibits for the 1925 exposition. Studios that Weber visited included those of Paul Poiret, Jean Dunant, and Léon Géot, as well as a meeting with the design director at the Printemps department store. One of Barker Brothers' executives also traveled to Paris to visit the exposition and came back to Los Angeles intrigued by the market potential of the French designs. So when Weber proposed that Barker Brothers devote a portion of its new downtown store to modern furnishings, the store's executives eventually agreed. Of modes and manners, a writer for Good Furniture magazine stated that, quote, when at some future date the history of the American modernistic furniture movement is written, the Barker Brothers store in Los Angeles and its designer, Kem Weber, will undoubtedly be recorded as among the early leaders in its development, end quote. The shop sold furnishings designed by the likes of himself and his friend Paul T. Frankel, alongside custom textiles and an array of objets d'art. It caused a sensation, and within a year, a second Modes and Manners was planned for Hollywood's El Capitan building, directly across the street from the newly built Grauman's Chinese Theater. The Hollywood Modes and Manners was an upgrade in terms of size, occupying nearly a quarter of the entire Barker Brothers outpost. It was also prominently located on the store's ground floor and enjoyed ready access to an upstairs workshop. Barker Brothers and other retailers in Los Angeles supported the burgeoning film industry through window promotions and in-house rental services for furniture and other products needed for set decoration. It made sense then that a few months after the Hollywood location opened, in January 1928, Weber helped organize the Barker Brothers Hollywood Shops Breakfast Club, where store owners and studio professionals could form useful contacts and discuss current projects. Publicity surrounding Weber's modes and manner shops attracted the attention of the managers at Macy's in New York, and Weber was invited to not only contribute to the store's 1928 Art and Industry Exposition, but was given the largest space and tasked with presenting a three-room apartment ensemble. His installation was a triumph, both popularly and critically. Later that year, audiences across the country would be treated to Gibbon's own interpretation of the skyscraper motif apparent in Weber's Hollywood store and in Frankel's sky, skyscraper furniture in MGM's Our Dancing Daughters. These are just a handful of examples showing how modernist designs were popularized in the years immediately following the Paris Exposition, with 1927 and 28 being particularly important years in terms of events across the country. There were numerous decorative arts exhibits in department stores from New York to Chicago, and finally also the West Coast. Furniture manufacturers were beginning to produce their own modernistic lines, and in addition to publishing his book New Dimensions, Paul Frankel helped to found the American Union of Decorative Artists and Craftsmen, in part to, quote, direct the so-called modern art movement in this country along more intelligent lines, end quote. I suspect that MGM's design for its film from the previous year, Women Love Diamonds, is not what they had in mind. I'm including this, like the previous Norma Shearer stills, to illustrate how Gibbons did occasionally incorporate more French or Art Moderne inspired furnishings in MGM's output prior to Our Dancing Daughters in 1928. 
The platform bed seen here would also appear in Daughters, as well as in The Kiss in 1929 and The Divorcee in 1930, among who knows how many other MGM films yet to come. The shirred fabric wall coverings, an efficient scale-enhancing technique, would also make an appearance in Greta Garbo's boudoir several years later in Grand Hotel. And although it's clearly dripping in decoration, Women Love Diamonds was not a smash hit. Our Dancing Daughters, on the other hand, was a huge success, and I think this is much more like what everyone imagines when they think of Art Deco in Hollywood. The film was widely publicized well before its fall 1928 release. Attention was given to its cast, its theme of jazz age youth, its use of shimmering incandescent lighting, synchronized soundtrack, and of course, its settings. The design of this film is credited to Gibbons and his talented unit art director, Richard Day. Day would leave MGM the following year and go on to design powerful sets for the 1930s classics Dead End and Dodsworth. The story shared in Dancing Daughters is noteworthy for how cleverly each home subverts expectations in terms of each lady's personality. Unlike most characters living in modernist settings, Joan Crawford and her family are forward-looking and thinking as well as morally well-grounded. It's a perspective that gets more slippery with each film in the series, and one you almost never see in the 1930s. Lighting is key for this film, and those that followed. Faster, more sensitive film stocks required less intense light to produce a quality image. Incandescents were smaller and more portable than the massive arc lights used up to this point. Their size lent themselves to use within the confines of sound stages, offering quick lighting setups and greater options in terms of cove and other decorative lighting techniques. They were also quieter, essential during the transition to sound films. It is a known fact that Gibbons preferred sets lit using a high key light, a bright diffuse light in which shadows are reduced and every corner as visible as possible. The opposite would be the shadowy low key light of film noir. MGM's preference for brightly lit big white sets was partly a desire to show off the quality of the settings, but it also meant that MGM product would look good even in the smallest theater using the weakest projector light available. I love one of the quotes identified in Howard Guttner's biography from the New York News, which observed that quote, modernistic effects in furniture and architecture are being used with a vengeance by MGM. Weird beds almost to the floor have little woodwork, save foot high boards which conceal the springs, end quote. The LA Times was even more succinct, stating that, quote, if you are looking for snappy, up-to-the-minute entertainment in people, sets, and atmosphere, it's it, and that's that. The tremendous success of Our Dancing Daughters launched the career of Joan Crawford and led to two additional films centered on the trials and tribulations of young moderns in the jazz age. Our Modern Maidens followed a year later and took the designs highlighted in Our Dancing Daughters to another level. One newspaper asserted that, quote, we believe it is the first time that the screen has shown such a faithful picture of the great revolution the French mode in home furnishings is about to effect. For Maidens, Meryl Pye was assigned as unit art director. Pye had recently completed work on MGM's first musical, The Broadway Melody, and the oversized approach of sets used in early musicals is equally apparent here, fitting for a film about music-mad youth. The home even has its own zigzag proscenium arch to frame Joan Crawford's wild dance. Pye would also be assigned the next film in the loose series, Our Blushing Brides, a sound film released in 1930. The dance scene in Our Modern Maidens stands out for its unusual expressionistic lighting and surprising zoom into Joan Crawford as she stands on the landing. However, the darkness is motivated by the narrative in which Crawford is about to perform a dance for the guests, complete with her own trailing spotlight. This scene is much more typical of MGM's lighting style. It is not only an almost impossibly enormous set, but it is also flooded with light, which reflects off every visible surface, including the very Ruhlman-esque and very shiny daybed in the foreground. When the scene shifts to the smaller den, continue to watch the furniture. This room contains almost every stock piece from MGM's modernist furniture collection.
Blushing Brides was another hit. Its settings, however, veer into the more ludicrous directions, with a massive bachelor pad located of all places at the top of a tree, seen here. Well, aren't you going to say something about my apartment? Sorry, I'd almost forgotten. <laughs> well, I'm done with admiration. Oh, but you haven't seen it yet. Wait a minute. And if you press this button and it lights all the pictures on the wall. See? Oh, and Jerry, that picture is a real, um, oh, what do you call it? <laughs> oh, David, tell me, but I've forgotten. <gasps> and look, Jerry, this photograph will play 12 records without changing. Do you remember that old thing we had that wouldn't play one unless you wound it up in the middle? <laughs> yes, I still have it. Oh, well, then I'm going to get you a new one. Between 1928 and 1932, moviegoers were deluged with MGM productions featuring ultra-modernistic sets, usually just the same suite of furnishings repackaged again and again, and not just furniture but entire wall units, light fixtures, and artwork, constantly sifted and rearranged for modern settings. The specific decorative features that you see again and again in sets from this time period are the tiered wall sconces, trapezoidal glass top table, angular Frankel-inspired sofa, zigzag fireplace curved club chairs, and the stock of white Brancusi or Paul Manship styled sculpture. Even the circular floating staircase that stood behind Crawford in Our Modern Maidens appears repeatedly, dressed and redressed a number of ways. The same year that Our Modern Maidens was released, Gibbons made a plea for additional sound stages, a wish that was granted, and granted again in 1936. Prior to the construction of new sound stages, Gibbons would have been acutely aware of the spatial limitations facing his staff, and it is only common sense that standing wall units, stairs, and other elements would be reused as many times as possible within similarly themed stories in production at that time. Intentionally or not, it is precisely the constraints that required such density of reuse between 1927 and 1929 that would cement the studio's association with progressive set design. By the early 1930s, Unit art directors typically worked on one or two films at a time, with production schedules lasting approximately 10 weeks. In 1938, Gibbons estimated that he was responsible for a staff of anywhere between 50 to 80 architects and hundreds of craftsmen, working on 53 pictures a year, each with an average of 15 to 40 sets. According to historian Mark Scheel, in an interview given that year, Gibbons explained that unless they were damaged or too expensive to repair, MGM's default policy was to store sets after filming, carefully inventorying them and their elements in a searchable index for future cannibalization. It was something his department had already been doing for over a decade. By 1930, Cedric Gibbon's reputation as Hollywood's most glamorous studio artist was firm. His marriage to actress Dolores Del Rio that year fascinated the press and public, but soon more attention was being paid to their Santa Monica home, designed by Gibbons with Pasadena-based architect Douglas Honnold. In publicity photos that were circulated widely through 1930 and 31, one can quickly spot furnishings that previously appeared in MGM productions and would continue to do so later. There is the metal-armed wing-backed chair seen in the office set for 5 and 10 in the lower photo, and the same trapezoidal table seen in literally every film above. Even the design of the fireplace and wall matches one that appeared appropriately enough in Our Blushing Brides the same year as their marriage. Given that MGM studio photographer Clarence Sinclair Bull took these publicity photos of the couple and their home, it is not really surprising that its interiors were dressed with a few studio extras. On the left is a comparison of the Blushing Brides apartment above and Gibbon's den below, with the same fireplace design, and on the right is a view of Leslie Howard's bachelor pad from 5 and 10, with a view of Gibbons' upstairs living room, both with step ceilings and low built-in bookcases attached to the seating modules. Gibbons' home blurred fantasy and reality through its appropriation of studio set dressing, 
It was also remarkably forward-thinking in terms of its spatial organization, with its large living room occupying a length of the second floor, lit by a dramatic wall of windows facing the home's backyard gardens and pool. After Gibbons and Del Rio divorced in 1941, the art director redecorated his home, but kept its modern style intact, commissioning his friend Paul Frankel to redesign the home's interiors. Two signature extant pieces from that period would be this mirrored dining table and speed chair. Frankel had moved to Los Angeles in 1934 and set up shop on Wilshire Boulevard and another shop later in Beverly Hills. In 1937, MGM was one of two studios, along with Paramount, to place very large orders for Frankel's new line of rattan furnishings. Although MGM auctioned off its props, furniture, and costumes in 1970, Paramount clearly held on to some treasures from the studio's golden age. By 1932, magazines were giving Gibbons credit for introducing modern design to the masses, with repeated mentions of his, not Richard Day's, achievement with the radical forms seen in Our Dancing Daughters, up through the modern style of Grand Hotel. An apparent clause in his contract with MGM stipulated that he get credit on every film he supervised, upwards of 1,500 a fact that irritated some of his unit art directors, but which consolidated his public image as the ultimate Hollywood tastemaker. What was going on at the other studios while MGM was diving into the world of zigzag modern forms, and who were the designers leading their art departments through this incredible time? One of this country's oldest studios, Universal's finances were never quite as solid as some of the other studios, although it did briefly benefit from Irving Thalberg's leadership where the boy genius was promoted from secretary to studio manager at 20 years old. Thalberg soon joined Louis B. Mayer and then, of course, MGM. Universal produced several well-designed prestige pictures in the early 1920s, mostly by director Eric von Stroheim, whose art director, Richard Day, would also later join MGM. And at the end of the decade, Universal produced two of the most storied musicals of all time, Broadway in 1929, designed by Danny Hall, for which the world's largest camera crane and production stage were created, and the Technicolor extravaganza King of Jazz in 1930, designed by Herman Ross, the latter winning an Academy Award for art direction. Here's just a little sample of the colorful craziness that is King of Jazz. During the Great Depression, Universal could not afford more extravaganzas like the ones you see here and its reputation rested on much lower budget series, like Flash Gordon and the Ma and Pa Kettle films, as well as genre pictures, mostly horror, with an endless assortment of Frankl Frankenstein and Dracula films to the studio's credit. Before leaving Universal in 1936, Chief Art Director Charles D. Hall nonetheless created designs for two of Hollywood's greatest comedies, Modern Times, and My Man Godfrey. Not a bad way to exit the studio. Columbia's output in the late 1920s and 30s is best remembered for the films of director Frank Capra, such as American Madness in 1932, which features a huge Art Deco bank interior, and the 1934 Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert picture It Happened One Night with its realistic roadside settings. For Capra's fantasy film Lost Horizon, Architect Stephen Cusson was able to draw upon another futuristic design he created for Fox a few years earlier. While the miniature created for Just Imagine cost a whopping $168,000, the budget for Lost Horizon topped out at $2 million, nearly half the studio's yearly production budget. The film was not a success, with audiences and critics alike confused and disinterested in its weighty themes. In the 1940s, Columbia art director Lionel Banks would offer a more conservative design approach with his stripped down and streamlined sets for the 1944 Rita Hayworth musical, Cover Girl. United Artists was not a typical studio, but was formed by creatives who distributed their films under the United Artists name. Its founders included Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, Charlie Chaplin, and D.W. Griffith. Many talented art directors worked on films at United Artists, typically renting facilities from other studios. But of these, William Cameron Menzies would be the most important, best known for his work on Gone with the Wind in 1939, for which he was granted the very first production designer credit by producer David O. Selznick. Menzies' designs vary widely, 
but a through line would be his dedication to using design to enhance dramatic action, often through unusual angles and striking perspectives. Richard Day has already been mentioned several times. He was an art director whose talent took him in many directions, sometimes as an independent and other times within studio settings. The Eddie Cantor musical for United Artists, Palmy Days, is just one example of how Day played with and expanded upon MGM's earliest modernist settings after he left to go work with independent producer Sam Goldwyn in the 1930s. Here Day trades in MGM's glamorous mansions for a gleaming international style bakery. Next up is the Big Five, Fox, Warner Brothers, Paramount, RKO, and MGM. 20th Century Fox was formed in 1935 with the merger of the Fox Film Corporation, itself founded in 1915, and 20th Century Pictures, formed in 1933. Despite its Art Deco trademark and a few stylish silent films, the studio didn't stray far from Americana, Shirley Temple, or historical pictures in the 1930s, before venturing into social realism in the 1940s, with such films as The Grapes of Wrath, Gentleman's Agreement, and Miracle on 34th Street. This latter period fell under the design leadership of Richard Day, the same Richard Day who has already appeared in association with United Artists and MGM. Warner Brothers did not have a strong supervising art director in the same way as other studios being described here. However, the studio was fortunate to have several amazing artists on staff, such as Anton Grot and Jack Oakey. Grot had the longest career, having moved to New York from Poland in 1909 before starting work as a scenic artist in 1913. He worked with William Cameron Menzies on several Douglas Fairbanks pictures in the 1920s, including The Thief of Baghdad, and eventually joined Warner Brothers in 1927, the same year the studio hit it big with a jazz singer. Seen here is just one example of the gangster pictures that Warner Brothers would become known for in the coming decade. Here, a haphazard array of modern furnishings evoke Rico's striving and his lack of taste. Grot's expressionistic style was particularly well-suited to Warner's crime films, such as the stylish 1945 noir Mildred Pierce. Warner Brothers musicals, on the other hand, are exuberant in their embrace of modern movement and design, and while art director Jack Oakey was only at Warner's for a short time, he designed two of the studio's best films, 42nd Street and Footlight Parade, both from 1933. His designs for the numbers choreographed and directed by Busby Berkeley are some of the most iconic settings to appear on screen, from the tiers of angular dancing skyscrapers in 42nd Street to the incredible human waterfall number in Footlight Parade. Berkeley's use of the female form as a decorative object in motion is legendary, as is his reputation as an extremely unforgiving taskmaster. His visual style of fluid geometries and abstract but harmonious lines composed primarily of women's bodies is perfectly aligned with how women were folded into decorative objects during this time, whether as lamps, ashtrays, hood ornaments, or simply objets d'art. He was a visionary who all but invented the modern film musical and its staging, and his work would be widely copied but never surpassed.
Before moving on from Warner Brothers, I just had to call out one more Jack Oakey design, his use of Frank Lloyd Wright's In His House in the 1933 melodrama Female. There are some actual exteriors shown briefly in the film, but this view of the pool and the crazy spiraling staircase are, of course, recreations, textile blocks included. Even so, you can't ask for a more modern femme fatale lair than this. The most short-lived of the majors, RKO still produced some of the most influential and iconic Art Deco films of the 1930s. These are almost exclusively musicals starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Prior to joining RKO, art director Van Ness Polglaze was briefly the head of Paramount Pictures' art department. He then went to MGM until 1929 and was raided by David O. Selznick when the producer joined RKO in 1932. Paul Glaze struggled with alcoholism, resulting in a short and erratic career, but early on he contributed many significant designs, whether at Paramount with the Magnificent Flirt or at RKO, where he kicked off the Rogers Astaire musical design aesthetic with Flying Down to Rio in 1933. As supervising art director, Paul Glaze managed to successfully blend all manner of decorative motifs, from neoclassical to historical to purely geometric creating a wholly unique and glossy style suited for Depression-era escapism. Unlike Busby Berkeley's standalone set pieces, which were paired with more mundane environments for dramatic scenes, Paul Glaze fills his entire films with fantasy and glamour. The rich combination of forms creates a larger-than-life stage for its stars to crack jokes one moment and perform the most elegant dance the next, elevating the film's rather weak plots by design. The unit art director most responsible for solidifying this style would be Carol Clark, who led the design work done for all the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers films of the 1930s. This is Ricardo Romero bringing you lovely music from the starlit heavens of the new Silver Sandal Cafe on the gala night of our grand reopening. Everybody's here. Clark also worked with a team of talented designers on these sets, including fashion designer and scenic designer John Harkrider, who was responsible for the Silver Sandal Club design featured here in Swing Time. I'd like to talk to Penny, please. All right, if you want to, but uh, won't do you any good. Ricky, please. All right. I'll be waiting for you in the car. Stripped of excess decoration, with gleaming black floors and tables draped in reflective cellophane, the set feels more akin to the clean, symmetrical lines of an MGM musical. However, the presence of the trompe l'oeil skyscraper floor painting and the planetary table lamps points right back to RKO's more playful approach. We're just going to let them dance for a moment. Enjoy. Next to Cedric Gibbons, Hans Dreyer at Paramount is the most significant supervising art director to work at a studio during Hollywood's golden age. As a designer, he is most closely associated with the expressionistic films of Joseph von Sternberg and the refined comedies of Ernst Lubitsch, with whom he worked from the very start of his career. Even though Dreyer claimed that Paramount had no house style 
and publicly stated that the visual look of a film should come straight from the story and not from the designer's mind. There is no denying the soft look of a Paramount film from this period, rich with detail and atmosphere across all genres. For Lubitsch, Dreyer's European sensibility provided elegant backdrops to match the filmmaker's sophisticated comedies. More refined than RKO and more layered with texture than MGM, Dreyer's varied designs for Trouble in Paradise are always top-notch and luxurious. Historian Frank McGill rightly notes that, quote, the stylistic flourishes in the decor are paralleled by the flourishes of composition and camera movements, which give the film's direction an Art Deco feeling as well. Hmm. We have a long time ahead of us, Gaston. Weeks, months, years. Eleven o'clock. A trained architect, Dreyer worked for the German government before being brought to the U.S. by Paramount in 1923. He was known for recruiting art department staff from area architecture schools and was much more hands-on than Gibbons, with his department sometimes called the Dreyer College. A number of prominent Los Angeles architects and designers worked under Dreyer, among them Jock Peters, responsible for modern interiors at the Bullock's Wilshire department store, and even Ken Weber, who was briefly employed as an illustrator in the mid-1930s, after being turned away by the low-status work offered by MGM, it should be noted. What were some of the other films that MGM produced during the transition to sound and throughout the 1930s, and how did the studio's style evolve during this time? Looking back at what Cedric Gibbons and his team of art directors produced between 1928 and 1932, the Greta Garbo features stand out for how well they consistently fuse fashion, star power, and the glamour of glossy modern decor into a perfectly designed studio package. Beginning in 1928 with A Woman of Affairs, the same year that saw the release of Our Dancing Daughters, and continuing in 1929 with both The Single Standard and The Kiss, stylish Garbo features transitioned into the sound era with Susan Lennox, Her Fall and Rise in 1931, and of course Grand Hotel in 1932. Garbo's last silent film, 1929's The Kiss, directed by Jacques Feder, includes an especially intriguing interior, one that bears a remarkable resemblance to the interior design of Robert Malay Stevens' Paris Villa, completed in 1927. Here's a quick side-by-side -side where you can see the blocky built-in fireplace, vertical dimensional artwork, and parallel wall-mounted bookcases, and Malay Stevens home on the left and reproduced by MGM for the kiss on the right, a film appropriately set in contemporary France. Another Garbo feature, Susan Lennox, Her Fall and Rise, demonstrates how MGM's modern interiors had matured over a very few short years of use. The layout of the apartment begs for movement with the carpeted steps at an angle and the swooping upholstered armchairs leading your eye back towards the building's glass curtain wall and the penthouse balcony beyond. Between the sheer drapes, pools of light, and plush furniture, the room hints at the more comfortable, streamlined interiors to come. A high watermark of MGM modern design came the following year in 1932 with Grand Hotel, which gave audiences one of the finest displays of modern storytelling blended with modern design in the early sound era. Gibbons was much more involved with the higher budget pictures, such as Grand Hotel, which he designed with Russian-born Alexander Tolobov. From the spinning doors to the spiraling checkerboard floor and round desk, the hotel design speaks to the film's interwoven and overlapping stories. Producer Irving Thalberg envisioned a star-studded superproduction where the studio's biggest stars would be brought together into an integrated story. The design mirrors the sophistication of this storytelling, with the more brightly lit public lobby and crowded bar filled with glass, metal, and geometric forms, while softer, more shadowy wood and upholstered furnishings populate the hotel rooms, each with slight variations according to its inhabitants.
set on the other side of the fence. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Baron, you're incorrigible. <laughs> Poor Gruzinskaya. How can she receive anyone? She can't. No, no, of course not. Theater, hotels, trains, trains, hotels, theater. Quite so, quite Well, so. I'm just on the lock. She'll be waking up and calling. Oh, I'm sorry, old fellow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Amazingly, even though the film was named Best Picture, its art direction was not nominated. Regardless, Grand Hotel can essentially be seen as the end of one era and the beginning of another, bringing MGM and its skilled art department into the era of modern sound film production. Who, uh, who are you, please? In the years that followed Grand Hotel, MGM's pictures featuring domestic settings stepped back from the ultra-modernistic sets of the previous five years and began to embrace more conservative forms, with neoclassical and colonial revival furnishings taking their place alongside more well-mannered modern interiors. The flamboyant great white set created for dinner at eight being used more for satire than anything resembling contemporary decor. A whole range of factors contributed to this shift, from MGM's late adoption of sound, increasingly strict enforcement of the production code, and the changing appetites of the Depression-era audience. It was also a result of the studio's loss of Irving Thalberg. The young producer had scaled back after an illness in late 1932, but never fully recovered and passed away in September 1936. He was just 37 years old. The 1933 film, When Ladies Meet, is a good early example of this transition. It was a huge success and featured a home crafted out of a barn conversion, bright and filled with furnishings that blend Americana with contemporary decor, painted beam ceilings, gleaming plank floor, and an overstuffed but smartly patterned furniture assortment. The studio claimed to be flooded with requests for floor plans and design details after the film's release. Less than 10 years later, it would be remade with the same title in 1941. This time, the home was not a barn, but an old mill complete with water wheel. Even as films like When Ladies Meet started to become more popular with audiences craving comfort over audacity, streamlined designs do still appear in MGM films throughout the 1930s. Of these, the musicals and the successful Thin Man films stand out. After MGM won its first Academy Award for its all-talking, all-singing musical, The Broadway Melody, in 1929, the musical as a genre quickly petered out as the marketplace was flooded with singing and talking pictures. In 1930, nearly 100 musicals were released. The enormous success of 42nd Street, Footlight Parade, and Gold Diggers of 1933, however, paved the way for a revival of the genre, one that would last for another 30 years. MGM joined the fray with The Merry Widow in 1934, featuring great white sets that mirrored those seen in Dinner at Eight the same year. But it was the studio's massive 1936 production, The Great Zigfield, that would produce one of the studio's most impressive sets, one they would spend years trying to top. For the song A Pretty Girl is Like a Melody, unit art director Merrill Pye, working with designer John Harkrider, who had worked with the real Zigfield, crafted an enormous 100-ton steel-framed revolving white volute that gets slowly revealed as huge curtains rise and the cameras move up the stairs, filled with singing extras. Apparently, when Harkrider complained that Zigfield wouldn't have done that, Gibbons replied, Zigfield never made a movie. Zigfield is another exemplar of Hollywood's great white set. True white was not used in set designs prior to the use of incandescent lighting. According to historian Beverly Heisner, filmmakers had, to avoid glare, been using gray and other colors to designate contrastive white areas in their sets. The big white set allowed sharper value contrasts and fuller detail in decor. More typical of the early MGM musical brand were the subsequent Broadway melody films, of which there were three between 1935 and 1940. MGM's newest dancer, the amazing Eleanor Powell, starred in all three films and many more, along with some of the studio's most impressive sets. 
Powell provided her own choreography and would consult with art directors to ensure she had the basic physical elements she needed for her dance numbers, though more often than not, she performed in clean, open stage settings, albeit often huge stage settings. Several stylish backstage musicals were produced in the 1930s, but the real heyday of MGM musicals would start with the formation of the Freed Unit in 1939, named for producer Arthur Freed which would introduce countless classics over the following two decades, with films like Meet Me in St. Louis, 1944, On the Town, 1949, Singing in the Rain, 1951, and Brigadoon, 1954, among many more. Between 1934 and 1947, MGM produced six Thin Man movies starring William Powell and Myrna Loy. The films vary in terms of their interiors, ranging from fairly simple but up-to-date apartments in the first film seen here to more sprawling interiors created for the couple's San Francisco home in the series' second installment, After the Thin Man, from 1936. The first film had had a fairly modest production budget, but its instant success meant another Thin Man was quickly put into production with nearly three times the budget, and it shows. I wanted to include some stills of the second Thin Man set here on the right to show how Gibbon's art department continued to remain current in terms of contemporary architecture and interior design. On the left are architect Alden Dow's Party Residence, built 1936, and Heath Residence, built 1934, both located in Midland, Michigan. I love how you can see an echo of the unit blocks and recessed fireplace seen in Dow's homes in the set reference stills for After the Thin Man on the right. The home design for Nick and Nora is a beautiful example of the flowing, open-plan, livable modernism promoted by Gibbons and Shelter magazines of the day. They also illustrate MGM's remarkable ability to evolve and engage with changing trends. If Grand Hotel was the swan song of MGM's love affair with European modernism, then 1939's The Women is the studio's going-away gift to a decade of modern interiors. Featuring two of MGM's most modern leading ladies, Norma Shearer and Joan Crawford, the film is another masterclass in the use of settings to reveal character and propel plot. Gibbon's taste is readily apparent through the film's clean lines, neutral palette, smoothed edges, and occasional dramatic gesture. The film's set decorator, Edwin Willis, spoke glowingly of how blending different styles can enhance characterization. When describing Mary Haynes' house, he notes that, quote, the handsome man mantles were inspired by those described by Nathaniel Hawthorne in the House of the Seven Gables. The painting of the little boy, Harlequin, after the manner of Picasso, is the type of thing the heroine might have seen in a gallery and liked. Far from being incongruous, it gives the room just the right personal touch and avoids a general effect that might seem too consciously decorated otherwise. The film updates and inverts the home as character premise of Our Dancing Daughters. Here, the heroine's contemporary conservative home is lauded, while the modern excesses of the striving crystal are ridiculed. After a decade of promotion, creative reconfigurations, and refinement of modernist forms, films like The Women and When Women Meet Earlier show how Gibbons could masterfully project and then pivot towards the more traditional settings that would come to dominate films of the 1940s. Ha <laughs> ha! I've had two years to grow claws, Mother. Jungle Red! Say, who are you to laugh, my pet? I've made good with my husband. Is that the way to talk to me after all I've done for you? Oh, done what? You didn't know a soul when you married Stephen. After all, it wasn't easy to put you over. Stephen's fed up with the crystal in your heart, you know it. Yeah, take my advice, because you put your mind on your alimony. Alimony? With what Stephen can get on you, he won't have to give you a dime. <laughs> MGM, as the most powerful studio in one of the country's most profitable mass market industries, wielded enormous power in its ability to shape and quickly respond to changing popular tastes. 
Cedric Gibbons, as the head of MGM's art department, played no small part in this effort, as evidenced by the films MGM released in the years following the 1925 exposition and throughout the 1930s. The studio's designs during this time both respond to and herald shifts in fashion, the decorative arts, and interior design as they evolved from an exaggerated European-inspired art modern idiom to sprawling, streamlined forms before finally settling into a more conservative and flexible, livable modernism. It would certainly be fun to trace how the suppression of modernist interiors in the late 30s and 40s led to a blossoming of colorful mid-century modern designs, but perhaps we should just end with this pictorial homage to the iconic Art Deco world created by Cedric Gibbons, Richard Day, Merrill Pye, and unnamed others at MGM, crafted by none other than a contemporary French filmmaker, which seems fitting. Thank you so much for taking time tonight to travel with me through such a long and winding road through the history of Art Deco film design and the important role played by MGM and its supervising art director, Cedric Gibbons.